Uh, what I was talking about at the beginning was the conventional Big Bang Theory, and now I'm talking about inflation, which actually is different. Um, in the conventional Big Bang Theory, uh, you observe that the universe is homogeneous, uh, and in the kind of simple concepts that one was willing to entertain in discussing the conventional Big Bang Theory, uh, a small egg would not work because it would never get to be big enough. It would always have a, a lump in the middle. Uh, so the only hypothesis, or at least the simplest hypothesis, that makes everything consistent with what we see is to assume that it started out completely uniform. Inflation differs by having this driving mechanism that makes this patch bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you can start with an egg or a marble. Uh, and because it can inflate, because it enlarges so much more than it would have in the conventional model, it can become so big that we no longer can see the center. Uh, it looks uniform just because the size scale uh, over which things change is huge compared to what we observe. So, you think so the egg theory comes back small. in the context of inflation as at least a possibility. Okay. So by the same token, you're saying that there is a center then? Uh, there could be a center. I'm not saying there is a center. Uh, there could be a center. Okay. There's certainly a center to the visible universe, where we are. Uh, okay. And beyond that, we don't really know. We don't have no idea what edges there are, do, not, do or do not exist out there. Yeah. So all the material in the initial universe, well, assuming there's only one incarnation, but uh, in the initial universe, is it contained within that patch, or is the patch contained within the material? <laughs> well, the, the, um, the um, <laughs> okay. I mean, is that correct right. way of looking at it? Or? But no, no, I think so, I think so. Um, the... Um, I'm sort of trying to explain the minimum amount you need to assume to make inflation work. And I'm sort of being deliberately vague about the things that don't matter because yeah. they, they could turn out different ways and it would all be the same. So we have a small patch that's going to evolve to become the presently observed universe. I really don't want to say anything about what happened beyond that patch because I don't know and don't need to know. Uh, the patch itself uh, started out, uh, I don't think I said it here, but it started out actually far smaller than the size of a single proton uh, before inflation. At the end of inflation, it's the size of a marble. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it grows, so uh, today it's uh, 10 to the 10 light years uh, in radius. So it's almost uh, mathematical, and it's never it, stop. then, you're Sorry? So theoretically, what we're saying is it's never going to stop expanding uh, because of this ne negative forces that are... Uh, that's what we now think, yes. Actually, you, you, you took several steps ahead of me there. I was still in the early universe. <laughs> but in fact, the steps you took were correct. Uh, we do think the universe is expanding probably forever. Um, yes? But the, but the repulsive gravity material uh, is gone now. It's a uh, theoretical. Okay. It's theoretical. Um, you're, you're taking me to the end of my talk. But I, <laughs> I withdraw the question. I withdraw the question. Okay, question we'll no come back questions. to that. <laughs> no, no, questions are welcome. Questions are welcome. But the question which I definitely plan to answer later. Okay. Uh, so that would be that question. That's a question I definitely plan to answer later. So I'll put it on it. Promises, uh, but uh, as far as uh, the repulsive gravity material that existed in the early universe, uh, allowing for the possibilities for other things to happen later, uh, this does disappear shortly. We're about to get there. Um, I think we're about here already. This, this item, this bullet, is the bullet about it disappearing. Uh, the repulsive gravity material is unstable, uh, so it decayed uh, like a radioactive substance decays, uh, ending inflation. And by decay, you mean it turns into something else. Turns into normal matter, matter with a positive pressure that does not cause repulsive gravity. Uh, and when it does this, this decay releases energy, uh, and that energy produces particles. Uh, and the particles then form a hot, dense, primordial soup, exactly the starting point for the conventional Big Bang theory. Uh, so, uh, so this conventional Big Bang theory takes over at this point. Uh, and the prequel ends, and we go into the main feature. Uh, now, a question I was asked is, was that mean, does that mean that all the matter was contained in this tiny little region that started out a billion times smaller than the size of a proton and ended up being at the well, size of a marble at the end of inflation? And the answer actually is no. Uh, it turns out that inflation actually uh, contains a mechanism for creating matter and energy as this little patch expands. Uh, so surprisingly, uh, the density of this repulsive gravity material, which is undergoing this exponential expansion uh, during inflation, uh, is not lowered uh, as it expanded. And that sounds kind of miraculous, so that's mm -hmm. going to be my miracle number two. Uh, so even though more and more mass and energy appear as the repulsive gravity material expanded, uh, total energy actually was conserved like it's supposed to be. 
Uh, and that's possible because of miracle of physics number two, and there will only be two, so this, is, this will do it. Uh, it turns out that uh, even though energy is conserved, there's a kind of a loophole about conservation of energy, which I think most people are not aware of, which is that energies are not always positive. Uh, and the key ingredient of the universe that, that corresponds to a negative energy uh, is the gravitational field. And this is actually true whether it's acting repulsively or attractively. Uh, a gravitational field uh, has negative energy density. Uh, and this is true both in Newtonian physics uh, and it's also true in general relativity. Um, so what that means uh, is that as the universe was undergoing this dramatic exponential expansion, the positive energy of this peculiar repulsive gravity material called the false vacuum uh, was compensated by the negative energy of gravity. Uh, so as the exponential expansion was taking place, uh, the total energy remained constant uh, with a cancellation between the extra energy that's being created in the form of the matter that filled this region, uh, which is positive, being compensated by the energy of the gravitational field that was filling this region, which was negative. And the total energy remains constant. It certainly remains incredibly small. Uh, and most likely, the total energy is exactly zero. Uh, there's no reason not to believe that. That seems to be the simplest description. Yeah? So that would answer why Hoyle says it won't contract. Uh, this is actually very similar to what Hoyle said uh, in many ways. That's correct. Uh, now, we don't longer think that Hoyle was right. We're pretty well convinced that Hoyle was wrong in <laughs> Patel, uh, because Hoyle was trying to describe a universe that was exponentially expanded Stop. right up to today. Uh, this does not do that, and that's not what the universe appears to do. Uh, this is exponential expansion that happened only during the first 10 to the minus 35th of a second or so in the history of the universe. But while it was happening, it is really very much like what Hoyle described. How does that fit with the asymmetry between matter and antimatter? Good question, good question. Um, it changes one's view about the asymmetry between matter and antimatter. In the conventional Big Bang theory, before inflation was invented, uh, when one assumed that all the particles were already in place, uh, one assumed that whatever asymmetry there was between matter and antimatter was there from the very beginning. There was no, no way that anybody knew of that could change. Uh, here, we're creating the matter uh, during the inflationary process, and that means that we better also be able to create the matter-antimatter asymmetry uh, during the early history of the universe. And the belief is that shortly after inflation, uh, reactions took place uh, which allow the net baryon number to change, uh, creating this excess of matter over antimatter that we now observe in the universe. Uh, now, this required a change in our understanding of physics as well. Uh, in the old days, and let me try to think when old was. Old was, I guess, through maybe about 1965 or so, or maybe 1970. Uh, yeah, I guess at least through 1970. In, in, the, in those old days, uh, physicists thought that baryon number was exactly conserved. And if it's exactly conserved, it means that you can't create a net baryon number. If you're going to create a baryon, you have to create a baryon-antibaryon pair. Uh, that belief uh, was first challenged by these grand unified theories. In the context of grand unified theories, uh, baryon number is not conserved. Uh, and uh, the original discussion of the possible production of bar the baryon excess was all done in the context of these grand unified theories. It was actually discovered later uh, that even without grand unified theories, even in what particle physicists call the standard model of particle physics, which is what we sort of confirm all the time in particle physics experiments, uh, it turns out that at very high energies one predicts that baryon number is not conserved in those theories either. It took a while before that effect was understood. It's, it's a fairly subtle effect uh, of these theories. Uh, so now, now I think all physicists are convinced that baryon number is not conserved. If you ask experimentally what do we see, nobody has ever seen any violation of baryon number uh, conservation. Uh, but in spite of that, physicists are, I think, universally convinced that it's not exactly conserved because according to all of our theories, it's not exactly conserved. Uh, conservation of total energy, I was wondering how that relates to the fact that there apparently is an asymmetry. What compensates for the asymmetry in the total energy equation? Uh, asymmetry between the energy of matter and the energy of antimatter? Well, that's not really where the asymmetry is, because the, both matter and antimatter have positive energy. It's, not, it's only total energy is what's discussed in the concept of conservation of energy. Uh, so there is a, a, what's called baryon number, where matter has positive baryon number and antimatter has negative baryon number. And that, as I said, 
physicists used to believe was exactly conserved, 